Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 6, verses 27 to 38, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. This is the word of the Lord. The teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ in these verses is confined to one great subject. That subject is Christian love and charity. Charity, which is the grand characteristic of the gospel. Charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity, without which a man is nothing in God's sight. Charity is here fully expounded and strongly enforced. Well would it have been for the Church of Christ if its master's precepts in this passage had been more carefully studied and more diligently observed. In the first place, our Lord explains the nature and extent of Christian charity. The disciples might ask, Whom are we to love? He bids them love their enemies, do good to those who hate them, bless those who curse them, and pray for those who despise them. Their love was to be like his own towards sinners unselfish, and uninfluenced by any hope of return. What was to be the manner of this love? The disciples might ask. It was to be self-sacrificing and self-denying. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. They were to give up much and endure much for the sake of showing kindness and avoiding strife. They were to forego even their rights and submit to wrong, rather than waken angry passions and create quarrels. In this they were to be like their master, long-suffering, meek, and lowly of heart. In the second place, our Lord lays down a golden principle for the settlement of doubtful cases. He knew well that there would always be occasions where the light of duty towards our neighbor is not clearly defined, He knew how much self-interest and private feelings will sometimes dim our perceptions of right and wrong. He supplies us with a precept for our guidance in all such cases, of infinite wisdom, a precept which even infidels have been compelled to admire. As you wish that others would do to you, do to them. Do to others as they do to us and return evil for evil is the standard of the heathen. To behave to others as we would like others to behave to us whether their actual behavior may be, this should be the mark of which the Christian should aim. This is to walk in the steps of our blessed Savior. If he had dealt with the world as the world dealt with him, we would all have been ruined forever in hell. In the third place, our Lord points out to his disciples the necessity of their having a higher standard of duty to their neighbor than the children of this world. He reminds them that to love those who love them and to do good to those who do good to them and to lend to those whom they hope to receive is no act better than the sinner who knows nothing of the gospel. The Christian must be altogether another style of man. 
his feelings of love and his deeds of kindness may be like his master's, free and gratuitous. He must let men see that he loves others from higher principles than the ungodly do, and that his charity is not confined to those from whom his hopes to get something in return. Anybody can show kindness and charity when he hopes to gain something by it, but such charity should never content a Christian. The man who is content with it ought to remember that his practice does not rise an inch above the level of an old Roman or Greek idolater. In the fourth place, our Lord shows his disciples that in discharging their duty to their neighbors, they should look to the example of God. If they called themselves children of the highest, they should consider that their father is kind to the unthankful and the evil, and they should learn from him to be merciful, even as he is merciful. The extent of God's unacknowledged mercies to man can never be reckoned up. Every year he pours benefits on millions who do not honor the hand from which they come or thank the giver of them. Yet every year these benefits are continued. Seed time and harvest, summer and winter, never cease. His mercy endures forever. His loving kindness is unwearied. His compassion fails not. So ought it to be with all who profess themselves to be his children. Thankfulness and ingratitude should not make them slack their hands from works of love and mercy. Like their Father in heaven, they should never be tired of doing good. In the last place, our Lord assures his disciples that the practice of the high standard of charity he recommends shall bring its own reward. Judge not, he says, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given to you. And he concludes with the broad assertion, with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. The general meaning of these words appears to be that no man shall ever be a loser in the long run by deeds of self-denying charity and patient love. At times he may seem to get nothing by his conduct. He may appear to reap nothing but ridicule, contempt, and injury. His kindness may sometimes tempt men to impose on him. His patience and forbearance may be abused but at the last he will always be found a gainer, often, very often a gainer in this life, certainly, most certainly, a gainer in the life to come. Such is the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ about charity. Few of his sayings are so deeply heart-searching as those we have now been considering. Few passages in the Bible are so truly humbling as these 11 verses. How little of the style of charity which our Lord recommends is to be seen, either in the world or in the church. How common is an angry, passionate spirit, a morbid sensitiveness about what is called honor, and a readiness to quarrel on the least occasion. How seldom we see men and women who love their enemies, and do good hoping for nothing again, and bless those that curse them, and are kind to the unthankful and evil. Truly, we are reminded here of our Lord's words. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Matthew 7.14 How happy would the world be if Christ's precepts were strictly obeyed? The chief causes of half the sorrows of mankind are selfishness, strife, unkindness, and lack of love. Never was there a greater mistake than to suppose that vital Christianity interferes with human happiness. It is not having too much religion, but too little, that makes people gloomy, wretched, and miserable. Wherever Christ is best known and obeyed, there will always be found most real joy and peace. Would we know anything by experience of this blessed grace of charity? Then let us seek to be joined to Christ by faith, and to be taught and sanctified by His Spirit. We do not gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles, We cannot have flowers without roots or fruit without trees. We cannot have the fruit of the Spirit without vital union with Christ and a new creation within. Such as are not born again can never really love in the manner that Christ enjoins. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, Jesus says we are to love our enemies. 
ultimately because he loved us while we were his enemies. Contemplate two things here. The Bible says we have enemies. Who are they, and how are we loving them? Second, in what ways do we like to be treated? Do we treat others in those ways? Third, the world has always known to love those who love them, but Jesus has called us to a higher standard. In what ways is God leading us to love or lend without expecting anything in return? And lastly, are we tempted to not do good or to grumble when others do not recognize our love or kindness? Are we content to give and be noticed by God alone?